Episode 7 of The Acolyte falls into one of the most unforgivable traps that a movie or TV show can fall into. Lying. Now I can tell that I were trying to go for the unreliable narrator trope, but Episode 3 was not a narration. It would have made perfect sense if Sol had been shown talking to Yord and Jeki, I remember it like it was yesterday. And then we got the story from Episode 3 with all of its inaccuracies. But instead, it was shown as a fly-on-the-wall documentary of the events on Brendock. It was not the memories of any one character. There are times when Sol is not present. There are times when May is not present. There are times when Osha is also not present that forbid Episode 3 from being anyone's flawed recollection. The person that Episode 3 is closest to being a recollection of is Osha. There are monumental events that she was not present for that would be unforgettable. The problem with having this style of unreliable narrator is that it's not framed by anything. By framing it within the context of Soul's memory, we can think about what events he was present for and those that he was absent from. Without this framing, we don't know which bits are the unreliable bits. Was it the cause of the fire that was tainted in Episode 3? Or was it the fact that Sol was even there that is a fabrication? We just don't know. And typically, if you show two recollections of what happened from two differing perspectives, they tend to show their respective sides as the good guys. The third episode of The Acolyte is ostensibly from the perspective of the Witches, but it shows them as the bad guys. Then, episode 7, purportedly from the Jedi perspective, shows the Jedi to be close to being called evil. It's hard to feel empathy for Aina Slayer when she mind freaks poor Tobin for the entirety of the first meeting. That's some funked up stuff. Now everything, not just in episode 3, but the entire series is called into question. What is real? What is false? We just don't know. I thought this show was a waste of time beforehand, but after episode 7 it's totally impossible to recommend that anyone waste their time on it if the show isn't going to respect us enough to tell us the truth. This episode reinforced my opinion that they were going for an all cops are bastards vibe, with the Jedi being the authoritarian police force who covers up their own misdeeds and invades private citizens dwellings based on their difference of culture. There's also a bit of an ice or immigration thing going on with people being forced into hiding and their children being removed in midnight raids. And how the hell did Torben go from a Padawan to a Master in the six years before he goes into his 10 year meditative trance. The guy was reckless and impatient, and he probably never explained how he got those gnarly scars. The speeder bike design is very ugly, and it looked dodgy when it was in motion. I'm not a fan. Also not a fan of a Wookiee using a metal detector and not sweeping it back and forth. I like the lightsaber fights, we finally got the Wookiee Jedi fight we all wanted. It could have been better. In the end, it devolved into a battle of brute force, but that may have been part of Kalnaka being possessed. It was odd how Kalnaka seemed to just have the strength of a really strong man, rather than some untamable beast that will rip your arms off at a moment's notice. No way Torben should have been able to block that lightsaber with a reverse grip on his opposite side. Oh, and the show introduces two new powers. When Torben was possessed, Mother Aina Slayer was actually talking to him in another realm. It was very simplistic though. She just asked him what he wanted instead of asking why they were there or getting any real information from him. And these women can turn into smoke and inhabit someone else's body, seemingly utilizing their skill sets once they gain control. But that was over and done with very quickly too. I'm also confused as to why Sol thrust his blade into Anus Taker's belly, and why it hurt her if she was a mist. What are the limitations of this power? I was interested in the conflict between the members of the Jedi party. Sure, it was simplistic and superficial, but at least it was something believable. Yeah, I reckon a young guy would rather be on Coruscant, rather than some backwater planet. It's just that there's no time to explore any of this, it's just an excuse to want him to end the mission. I'm not sure why they couldn't sleep in their own beds every night. After the last episode, 
showed us that you can travel to the outer rim in less than an hour. That's basically the average commute. It was a bizarre choice to have the Jedi doing this research and having been there for seven weeks, not having told one of the four party members why they are there. If a virgence in the force is so monumental, surely a Padawan who has been trained for what, 16 years, should have heard something about it. They could have solved this by having the Jedi guarding some scientists who are collecting the samples. Collecting lumps of Carrion's moss? Just get some of the witches to act as extras in white suits with masks on. Then Torben can be guarding them against ferocious wildlife or bandits and not need to know why they're on this planet in particular. You're here to guard the scientists. The Vergence in the Force concept is interesting, but it only serves as a reason why the two groups are running into each other. That would have been interesting to explore. What does it mean and what can it do? Produce life, apparently. Why did it only produce girls? Why twins? In this flashback, May does not tell Osha that she's going to kill her. May also acts more like she is attempting to examine the drawings in Osha's book rather than deliberately set them on fire. And May also attempts to put the fire out before it spreads too far. May also calls for help from her mother, which is absent in the original flashback. Although, there Osha yells, Mama, help me! This leads me to believe that the entire events of the episode 3 flashback can be thrown away. Nothing in that episode happened. Therefore, it was a waste of 30 minutes to watch it. Who knows? Maybe the terrible power of many chant was all a hallucination. But by whom? Again, the show does not set this up as the memories of any particular individual. And for this reason, the episode fails and takes the whole show down with it. I think the biggest twist in this episode is that May specifically tells the Jedi that in order to ascend, they need to sacrifice themselves. After Sol witnessed the witches worshipping the gaping black hole in the ground. Yeah, I think you probably have to intervene then. Sol also saw Anus Slayer force pushing the girls and made the noise that Coral heard. I went back and checked and you don't get to see him in the background. It would have been nice to go back and see a shadow moving around in the background in these scenes to really tie it together. I love how Aina Slayer turns into a spooky dark phoenix and when she rightly gets stabbed she turns around and says I was going to let Osha go with you. Lady, you just got done telling them they should not have come back and shape shifting into some kind of ghoul. What are we to believe? The whole thing with the witches joining forces and controlling Kalnaka and then dying when Trinity severed the connection was weird. I thought the power of many should beat the power of one. And where did Mother Coral go? Was she trapped in Kalnaka when the connection was severed? Did she waft away somewhere? Sol trying to support the two halves of the bridge while he could have lifted the girls themselves. Hilarious. You know, I've been pretty lenient on this show in the past, hovering around a 5 out of 10. It's had some interesting bits and some stupid bits but for the most part, it's just been dull. But after this episode, I'm done giving it the benefit of the doubt. It's poorly constructed. We're now at a point where everything is brought into question. Was Kiyati Mundi even on Coruscant after all? We will never know. This episode on its own was probably a 5 or a 6. There were some interesting elements, but they were glossed over so much that I'm dropping it down to a 3. And with the unreliable narrator issue, we're down to a 1 out of 10. I was going to go with a 2. But this episode makes the entire series pointless. If they don't respect my time, then I'm not going to go easy on them. It's a weird choice to try and make the Jedi out to be the bad guys. I mean, part of the reason we like Star Wars is the battle of good and evil. The good Jedi versus the evil Sith. With the Acolyte, it seems like they're trying to tell us that maybe our faith was misplaced and we should be siding with the Empire all along. You know, the guys who wear uniforms designed by Hugo Boss. We still don't know what happened to the planet with Divergence and the gaping black hole. We need to find out where Kamir came from, how he found May, how he got removed from the Jedi Order. We need May and Osha to fight or work things out. 
We need to work out what the relationship is with Kamir, Sol, and Vanestra. No way this is going to be wrapped up in one last episode, unless it's 90 minutes. If this isn't the longest episode yet, there's something wrong. It's clear now that Star Wars is trying to cultivate an audience that is anyone but the average Star Wars fan. Thanks for your money, but we'd rather try and appeal to the margins than the massive fan base we already have. And good luck to them. I just hope they keep pumping out the hilarity like they have with the Acolyte. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.